Southeastern Bow Hunter Podcast. We got someone on the podcast today that, you know, I uh, like to consider a friend, you know, I look up to him. The dude's got, I don't know, look, seems like over a hundred giant whitetail kills. And, uh, you know, his advice is always something I listen to. We got Mr. Joe Miles from Osseo Gear. Um, Joe, you know, you and I were just talking, I don't know, for a couple minutes before this, but for the people who didn't hear that, what's uh, what have you been up to, man? How's trade show season been? Like, what's yeah. what's new? Busy, man. We're product development stage with Osseo. We've got new products coming in every day, samples and prototypes. So we're, we're looking at all of that. Uh, trade show season is in full effect. We uh, really started that the 1st of January and have been going every single weekend. Basically, we had the big Harrisburg show in PA, which is a nine or 10 day long show. So that one kicks everybody's butt. But man, it was good. We had uh, have, have had really good trade shows, really good feedback on the gear. And this past weekend, I was with Bobby Worthington. He and I have got a what we call the Mission Whitetail ultimate field course and it's two days of rut funnels how to identify rut funnels how to dissect trail systems and he, he's got a lifetime of, of being in the woods and being around him and seeing his woodsmanship is infectious and just a great guy to be around yeah man i saw you you know i, t- <laughs> I told you that i wanted to talk about this so i'm glad you brought it up um what exactly like you know what got you wanting to do this? Because I saw like your post on Osseo, you were saying that, you know, this is what we would normally be doing if we weren't so busy. So what, like you're saying, looking for rut funnels and you're looking for trails and all that stuff. That's kind of something that I sort of struggle with is yeah. sort of dissecting, um, you know, trails and all of that. I-, I feel like I can find them, but my cameras are telling me differently. Uh, without, I guess, giving it away too much, like what are you guys looking for in that? So, so Bobby has a philosophy, and I don't, I don't really want to speak totally for him, but I'll, I'll give my summary version mm-hmm. of you know his strategy of how he hunts. He does not do anything before about October twenty fifth if the weather is right, and then he will hunt if the weather is right, and and define that being below normal temperatures october 25th so if the the average in the day is 50 degrees and we get 45 degree days down into the 20s 30s whatever it may be then he will start hunting around october 25th and then he will go hard up until thanksgiving uh, basically every single day Mm -hmm. so that he does not want to do anything before then it has been his experience now he's a big woods public land uh, he, he hunts some private as, as well, not, you know, managed farms. He, he's never really done anything managed farms. It's always been public mm-hmm. or big woods. So this is his philosophy on those areas. And again, October 25th to Thanksgiving, he's a big rut guy. And then he finds the tightest funnel in the area that he can hunt. And he rots there. He gets in there, sets up a north wind stand, a south wind, or east-west, depending on whatever the wind sets up for in that area. Some of them you you can only hunt in mornings because of thermals and being in hill country. Some of them you can only hunt in the afternoons. Same same reason with the setting sun and thermals dropping, you know, down in those valleys. Some of them are only morning. Some of them are only evening. So he he dissects all of that. and, And basically what he does is he looks at terrain features like, big ditches, big draws that come up and, and make it very difficult for deer to cross them. So they will go to the end of that terrain feature and go around it. And normally when you find those type areas, you'll have three or four or five long range trails or long range corridors, if you will, that come together around that big feature. And, and that'll be the funnel that he will hunt. And that's, that's easier. It's, it's funny, you know, all 10 of the guys that were at the course this weekend have read just about everything Bobby's put out there, listened to every podcast that he's been on and still really, really struggled on identifying the right spots and the right tree to get in. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is his philosophy It's worked very well for him. And 
you know, there's a lot of knowledge to be taken from him and put everybody hunts differently, yeah. but hearing a guy like that, you, you know, Don Higgins is another guy that we, we talk about a lot. He's a more of a private land habitat guy. And, you know, you can take stuff from Don, you can take stuff from Bobby, you can take stuff from any of these guys and, and build your own system. Uh, so, so for me, you know, I, I do like to jump on them early. I, I'm lucky I've got a August 15th opener here in South Carolina and you can get on the bigger deer here and you can get one killed in velvet. And, and then I enjoy, you know, going to Kentucky or Alberta, you know, where the seasons do come in earlier. And then, then, you know, I, I do some stuff in October. The rut down here starts in October where, where Bobby's system, I won't say breaks down, but it, it's harder is in flat land, you know, swamp country where there's not a lot of terrain features like big rolling hills and draws and uh, ridges and, you know, a lot of topo that forces deer a certain way. So you, you, you take what you can and you build your own system out. Yeah, man, that's honestly like, that was the biggest thing for me this past season is, you know, talking with guys like you guys like Clifton Denny, uh, Richard fought, you know, guys that kill big deer. And I've been hunting <clears throat> public a lot more this past season. And one of the things that I really, really struggled with is separating from what I think they're going to want to do. Cause in my mind, it's like, all right, a big buck wants to be, you know, in thick stuff, which is true. But when you're doing the rut, it's, it's totally different. Like you never kind of, you never really know. I went to a place last season where, and I'm pretty sure I've told you the story uh, where I saw like the biggest year of my life in the rut, same weekend that I was there. And Dude, I saw a one-year-old doe and a little button spike buck. That was it. Now, I had big deer on camera. Um, of course, they daylighted two days after the season went out. But it was one of those things where I'm looking at the maps while I'm in the tree. And I'm like, well, how am I, where, where do I go? You know, because the only thing that I've learned, I guess, I shouldn't say I've learned, but the only thing that I've been able to put into practice, really, um, with the limited schedule that I've had recently is looking at like the, the um, online mapping. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Uh, I'm sure you guys use like Onyx or Spartan Forge or something. Um, but one thing Clifton Denny told me was that if you look at every deer he's, or not every deer, but a lot of the deer that he's killed that are Pope and Young or whatever has been on or near the fat line on the topo map. I've been to those spots. And it's basically what I've noticed with those is it's kind of like if you got two ridges, it's the lower part of those two ridges. And so I don't know if that's something you guys have noticed, but it's. Yeah. So we, we, um, we'll look at a topo, but, um, man, that, that doesn't tell the story. Um, and, and I know that goes against a lot of the trends on, on social media and podcasts nowadays without boots on the ground. Uh, and walking in there, I mean, there there can be four or five trees that have fallen that, you know, or, or don't show up on a topo, and they're forcing mm -hmm. deer around a bench. Uh, there, there's a the, the deer are going to go where they want to go, and without boots on the ground and seeing where those trails are, sure, if there's a giant bluff uh, that's that's got a ditch on one side of it, that's an obvious place. But yeah. um, as far as the 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 e scouting and and saying, oh, that's where I need to go in the morning. Wow. I, I mean, I, I'm sure that happens for some people. It's just never happened for me. And I know it's never happened for Bobby because he yeah. he will go in and actually walk that thing and blow it up to actually see what the deer are doing. And, you know, it's all about whatever it is that's pinching them down. And again, that that can be seen some. But we looked at last weekend, we looked at 20 different funnels and you would have picked two of them up on a topo. Wow. And some of them were absolute highways where five and six trails came together to get around one little pinch but their deer were coming from five different directions and they all merged right there and i mean i, I called it the ray charles fun but you would have never seen it from a topo map you you would have never ever ever seen it yeah and so to me the boots on the ground are, are the vital yeah you you can get ideas from onyx um you know, or the other map features, sport and forage, or hunt stand, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but w the, the boots on the ground, to me, is the most important thing. I want to verify 
Yeah, I mean, that I, I have to agree because, you know, me and my buddy went scouting on the same piece of property uh, three weeks ago, something like that. And I told him, I'm like, I got four spots I want to check out. One of them's this field that is clover and it gets overgrown and they cut it and all this other stuff. That's where I saw the biggest deer on camera last year. No daylight photos after like mid August, right? But I put a camera there, went to this ridge system I'm telling you about, put a camera up there, found what I thought was a trail. So basically what what I've I guess have a question about is like on this ridge, and and I'm not expecting, you know, you to be like, oh yeah, it's definitely that, but just your opinion on it. When we got to this ridge, I I swear I was able to see this trail coming up the ridge where I've seen deer before. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna put my camera on that. So I put a cell cam on that and I've gotten two photos of the same doe within a three week period going across what I thought was the trail. So that kind of makes me question like, okay, is that not a trail? Is it just maybe where people are walking? I know deer are going to do what deer are going to do, but when you see that, like that would make you think, oh, there's definitely traffic here, right? So so you, you put your camera on it now, like just a week or so ago? Yeah. So my whole plan was kind of to do the Mike Perry deal or the Michael Perry deal um, where you put cameras out early. Don't go back there. Just sort of find sign. Like we found scrapes, we found rubs. I've got a camera over a scrape around um, the area you were talking about, like the type of, you know, terrain and everything. We just walked up here, looked around, found a still being used scrape. And I was like, okay, well, let me just put something there to see. And then we walked back down, found multiple more scrapes, found a bunch of turkey sign, uh, rubs. Just we did the, I mean, we walked probably 15 miles in six, seven hours. So, I mean, did we you, found a lot. Did you put a camera on the scrape? Yeah. And, and you didn't get any deer in the scrape? Well, it wasn't. So that was a regular camera. I only had one cell cam. Uh, yeah, uh, so yes. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. So, only, so it, what, what, I, what I would say or what I would argue in that situation is a lot of these rut type areas and rut type funnels, they're probably not getting a lot of traffic right now because mm -hmm. the season's over. It's, it's still considered quote unquote, late season, winter season, you know, we're just getting into March. Food sources are totally different. The mm -hmm. bucks aren't out traveling miles and miles looking for does. So that stuff might be red hot in that October, November time when the bucks are rutting and really traveling through those areas. And in the summer and in the late winter, you know, they're on completely different food sources. And so it won't be, it won't be as hot <clears throat> or you won't get as much traffic then. That, that would be my, you know, to look at it seasonally. And I, I don't know Mike Perry. I know Mike. I don't know his philosophy that well. Mm -hmm. But but I would assume that what he's saying is get those cameras in there now, March, you know, time frame, and then check them next March. And yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, you're going to see a huge difference depending on the area you're in from March, April, May, June, July, August, and October, November, early December. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be complete difference because it's totally different buck activity during those different times and totally different food sources. Yeah. And that's, that was the main goal when we were there is I wanted to cover every, every spot that I knew about and new spots too, just to check like for sign and all that other stuff, you know, go to food sources that I know from previous years they use. And I will say that, you know, again, going back to what you're saying about boots on the ground is, is the best thing. Dude, we found this bedding area that we bumped, we bumped probably four or five does out of that I've wanted to go check out, but just never did. And so we walked down there and I mean, it, it looked perfect. It's right between, there's a food source that they have on the left side. You've got cover on the right side and then it's nice and flat. It's not, or not really flat, but it's not, you know, 700 foot here, 700 foot here, and then super steep. You know, so I have a camera there, too, <laughs> and I'm just yeah. I'm just going to check it. I mean, it, it's going to be tough because I know how I am. Right. Like talking with Michael, you know, when he came on the podcast, he said he puts a camera out. Obviously, over, you know, where he thinks deer are going to be at, where he sees sign and then he just doesn't touch it. He'll come back when he hunts it, maybe pulls the card then or maybe just waits till season's over and then goes and pulls the card and goes off of last year's data. So I'm sort of starting that over there um 
but I know how I am, dude. I'm probably going to end up going middle of July when it's sweltering hot out and go check those cameras. So sure. I can't help it. I can't yeah. help. It. Yeah. Well, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see what comes from this. Cause you know, I'm still relatively new. I mean, especially on the hunting, the public side of it, um, private land, dude, I've, I feel like I've got those places locked down. Yeah. Uh, I still have nothing to show for it except for pickles over here, but you know, it takes time. But oh, um, man, absolutely. It takes time. So I kind of want to shift over to what's going on with Osseo because, you know, I push y'all every week. Um, I try to be annoying to you guys with how much I share the ads and all the stuff you guys post. Um, but I know that there's, isn't there a new line Osseo 2.0? So we, we've done some fabric changes and some collar changes, um, and, and the fabric changes really are on our kind of our mid Sherpa line set and our late season stuff. We, we did a panel system where the back of the garment has got a more high pile fleece, so it's quieter if you're you know leaning up against trees or you've got a saddle on your back. It's going to be quieter when you move, but then we kept the face of the garments with our grid fleece, so it has more of like a 3D dimensional look and the camo pattern really pops better. When you get into that real high pile fleece, it distorts the camo mm. and, and kind of null and voids it out because the the ink, when it's wet printed, it kind of sinks in between those fibers so that the camouflage does not have the integrity that it will on more of a slightly brushed fleece, which is what we have on the face of those garments. And then we've redesigned our jacket collars. We've got a patent pending bow hunting collar where it, it scallops down, you know, you, you've got, but most everybody's got the same collar design where it's that full collar that you zip all the way up and it's right mm -hmm. under your chin. And from a warmth perspective, that's really good. But if you've got that thing unzipped a couple inches, I mean, I've seen it on probably 50 different videos of guys being drawn back and, and letting off their release and their string clipping their collar. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, sometimes it doesn't affect the shot and sometimes it really does badly depending on how much it hits it. But it also, can affect your anchor point when you got that full collar and you you draw back and you get anchored and, and that collar is in the way it can be an issue so we we fix that problem and just scallop the collar down to to basically below your adam's apple so that it's it's not in the way at all and then if you want the warp you can just put on a neck gaiter or a face gaiter or something and have it to cover up your neck so so that's new with the fabrics nice yeah i uh man that is one thing i really like about y'all is that you guys pretty much cover everything you know like y'all really do seem to cover everything from a bow hunting perspective and a gun hunting perspective that when it's hot out it's not that hot with you know osseo on but then when it's cold you can put on that sherpa stuff and you're just sitting there all nice and toasty which i remember man i used to be so cold and looking like the, you know, the Michelin marshmallow man or whatever yeah. in the tree, like, ah, how am I going to pull this back? <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's one thing I do push, you know, I try to push as much as I can with y'all is that it's, it's not just your average Walmart camo, you know, like it is high quality and, you know, it's, I'm a big fan, dude. I could say great things about it all day long. So. Well, I appreciate it. Th thank you very much. We, we course, appreciate man. that a lot. And, you know, we're working hard to, to build the best bow hunting whitetail clothing line that we can build. Uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're working every day to make it better, better, better. So are there any plans to, I guess, maybe do a different type of, I don't want to say bird of prey, but like, I guess a different type of raptor design because y'all have the owl. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we, we really, it's, it's kind of designed off of a great horn owl with the feather pattern you know, the shadowing, the coloring, because it just blends so well in the timber. Mm -hmm. It's a natural ambush predator camo. And that that is kind of the gap that we fill. You, you know, if I feel like if we expand into the Western hunting stuff right now, we'll get our teeth kicked in. But yeah. because there's great lines out there that, that that's where they were founded. That's where their home is. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we saw the gap being high-end quality, super quiet apparel for whitetail guys that is whitetail, very whitetail specific. We, we really thought the market was missing a good camouflage pattern on high quality apparel. So that's the gap we saw and, and the one we wanted to fill. So what you're saying is there's not going to be a 4th of July edition American Eagle? 
<laughs> no, I, I don't think so. We might have some American Eagle t-shirts coming, yeah. but um, yeah, I don't see us coming out with like a Hulk or an Eagle or, or any, any type uh, thing like that. I, I don't see that happening. Cause it probably, I mean, it honestly probably wouldn't blend in as well as the pattern you guys have chosen. You yeah. I mean? I mean, if you, everybody, you know, so funny now, every time somebody goes out and hears an owl, they, they think about Osseo gear when they're in the deer woods and I get <laughs> millions of, not millions, but I get hundreds of messages and, and texts and everything, man, I'm sitting in a stand right now. These owls are going nuts and all I can think about is Osseo gear, which <laughs> I didn't even mean for that to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it just, it, it's, it's, a uh, I guess it's a really good marketing tool. Um, <laughs> but th they just, they hunt from trees, they're in the timber and they're, they're deadly and they're quiet. Yeah. And it just, for, for us, it made a lot of sense. See, it's so funny you say that dude. Cause I meant to text you Saturday night. We were in Atlanta at, um, an event with my brother-in-law and we were at this, he wanted to go to some, uh, brewery right and i don't drink anymore so i'm just sitting there drinking a sprite or whatever and my wife and sister-in-law were like hey uh we want a pizza can you go out there and grab one so there was a pizza truck like right next to this brewery and uh i go outside and i hear an owl and i instantly thought of you guys i was like man i should text joe and be like dude guess what i just heard yeah it's it's awesome i love it man yeah. it's it's good stuff and and That's it's so funny, funny you know that yeah, it's neat to have a have a marketing tool that's actually out in the woods hunting, and mm -hmm. and we don't have to pay them. The owls are doing that for free. <laughs> so yeah, I I had an owl fly past me uh, one morning this this past season, and I was just like, because I like say, kind of the same story that you had told about Osseo. Like I watched it, and then it just disappeared, and I'm like, I get it, I totally get it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, man, that's awesome. So all right, shifting again. Um, I want to talk to you. I'm going to ask you what you would rather talk about first. I don't usually do this, but I feel like this, this could go honestly, probably till the end of the podcast. So would you rather cover your deer season, which I know you were successful on, or if I'm not mistaken, you made a video last year talking about your current arrow setup and that you were going to change it. Did you change it? No, no, I'm not. The, the only thing I was thinking about changing was my knocks and okay. maybe coming down a little bit in weight, but, but basically it's going to be the same setup. I'm, I'm going to still run four fletched, um, probably the heat veins or the Q2s. I'm going to run those. The, um, I, I still am not sold. I've had a lot of trouble with the nocturnals lately. I don't know what happened. That, that used to be just, I, I don't know if, if nocturnal, I, I I don't know what happened there, but the, the quality of them the last couple of years for me has really fallen off. When I put them on my string, they'll fire. Um, it's a pain to turn them off. Um, I've had a few break. Just anyway, I'm not trying to bash nocturnal. Yeah, I'm course. just telling you the, the, the facts on that. So I am looking for a new lighted knock. Uh, broadhead wise, I'm going to, you know, I love the tripan. I uh, like the uh, G5 has got a new one coming out called the T2. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get my hands on a few of those in May. Got a hunt coming up in in May that I'm I'm really wanting to try those out on. And then uh, also the the Mega Meat, the G5 Mega Beat is now the number one selling broadhead in in North America. So that's pretty neat. And they've been around for a while. So if they're really failing and falling apart, and guys weren't stacking stuff with them, they certainly wouldn't be the especially with the way social media is nowadays, they wouldn't be the number one selling broadhead on the market. Um, so yeah, not doing a whole lot of changes. I've, I've, I try and try to make changes. I talked to all the era companies about what they've got coming out. And I still really like the victory rip TKOs. That, that's my favorite era. I love that weight, love the strength of those eras. The tolerances are incredible. So right now, you know, sticking with, with basically the same, I, my, I may play around with my insert. I've got a 60 grain insert right now that, that comes with the arrows or you, you mm -hmm. buy them as their stainless steel kind of half out. And so I may play around with that a little bit, but um, pretty much staying the same course, just some small tinkering there. Well, I have a recommendation for you for uh, okay. knocks. Have you heard of Halo Knock? You're the fifth guy to tell me that in the last two weeks. So I appreciate that. And I'm definitely <laughs> – I'm definitely going to pick some of those up and, and give them a shot, but I have, I've heard that. And the other beautiful thing I've heard about them is they're light. Um, you yeah. know, I, I don't like to have a whole lot of weight in the back of my arrow. 
I, I like to have the weight up front um, so, or, or more weight up front. So, yeah, if I can save 10 or 12 grains, I think the nocturnals are about 25. And if I'm not mistaken, these halos are around 12 or 15. And I know that's not a lot of weight savings, but but that, that's my understanding. You, you may know better than me what the weight is. I was going to say, dude, because last time I checked, because um, I've had nocturnals before, and this was probably like two years ago, but I think they were around like 35. And then the halos, I want to say were like 20 or 21 or something Could like be. that. I, I got a pack of, let's see what we can find out. All right. <laughs> there you go. And I could be wrong. I mean, I haven't, you know, I'm not even going to lie to you, man. I've, I've found that some of the Amazon ones that you get for like 15 bucks, uh, they work fine. But yeah, yeah, there, there you go. And I am not seeing a weight on this package, so I'll have to weigh them. But which ones I, are those? Th these are the um, nocturnals. Um, they're the universal fit. Um, so they do have the little adapter, but the two oh four is the one I use. You don't have to use the adapter on. Yeah, I do not see. I see directions. I see everything but the weight. So yeah, I, I'm not. It doesn't say on the pack. So anyway, I thought it would say it, but it doesn't. Oh, well. <laughs> we can yeah. do it. No big deal. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I just you know you brought up the mega meets, man, and like I used to shoot um, mechanicals, and then we partnered up with, partnered up with VPA, and I got some of those Omega single bevels, and I I don't think I'm ever going to turn back. I might when I go hog hunting this this summer. I might take a sever with me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole thing, I used to, I still love the Mega Me, right? But because I know how I am, um, I was hunting with one last year before, before the whole VPA thing. And I had a doe uh, 25 yards. Now I had the Mega Me, tip of the arrow. And I had, I had like a, or I had a system where I would, you know, check the blades, right? Like make sure I hear that little, when you pop them in. And I did that and I don't know what happened. I'm convinced one of the blades opened up. Now, the reason I'm convinced of that is when I shot, it went eight inches to the right, gut shot her. Thank God it was that mega meat because if it wasn't, she probably would have ran off much further, but I watched her and saw a hole about that big literally as she was running off she only went 40 yards behind me and of course i was sick to my stomach i felt terrible it's it's not a good situation yeah but i started thinking about it more and i was like well wait a minute that's the same broadhead i used the prior year on pickles i don't know if i ever changed the collar so the only thing i would say to anybody and in, including myself or anyone that's going to shoot those as soon as you shoot them change that collar out because it probably, uh, you know, would have been a perfect shot if I had done that, but I neglected to do so. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, I, I get it, guys. You know, we, we did a roundtable thing in, in Shipshawana, Indiana with some old school hunters, guys that have been around forever. And I was the only guy on the stage that that shot mechanicals. And and I understand a guy that shoots a well-built fixed blade head. I, I, I get it. I, I can argue that side of the equation a lot. Um, and understand that. So I, I have no, you know, guys that shoot, shoot, uh, you know, fixed blade heads. I, I understand why, um, yeah. where, where I really get, um, where, where I disagree, I don't disagree with shooting a fixed blade head where I disagree is this extreme heavy arrow stuff for white tail deer. I, I don't, I don't fully understand that. And, and I don't want to go down that soapbox, but, um, <laughs> we, we were talking about broadheads. <laughs> so um we'll just leave it at, at broadheads um and so yeah i get it why why a guy shoots a, a single bevel fixed blade head and and wants to maximize penetration um totally get that yeah I, i'm glad you didn't want to go down that road because last week tim gillingham completely shredded that theory like aggressively <laughs> the, the heavy the heavy arrow theory yeah yeah, yeah it, it's it was it's, so funny dude yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me um yeah. whatsoever. But but anyway, yeah, we if you've yeah. already talked about that and and I Tim, I mean he he knows he knows more about archery and archery setups, 
you know, than, than I will ever know. And, and he's tested and tried and world-class shooter. And so, yeah. yeah, he can, he can talk all about that um, every day of the week. Yeah. After talking with him and then Josh Jones, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with him um, from podium archer, he, both of them told me that my current weight in their opinion was maybe a little heavy. Cause right now I've got, um, I think my current arrow weights like 490. Yeah. And I upgraded bow. So I'm shooting 70 pounds now. I think yeah, last I checked, my speed was like 263 or four, um, which is good. It's much faster than I was last year. But after talking with them, they're like, really, man, you know, you, you don't need that. You can, go lighter still you know especially if i'm using the fixed blade um so now i'm yep. getting some arrows built and sent out to me that are uh, like 435 ish and that should have me around 280 which i know everybody t-bone everybody is like you want to be around 280 so that's where i'm gonna be yeah i think with a with a fixed blade definitely um that 280 280 mark is good um and and i agree man uh that 450 seems to be what everybody stays around i'm, I'm a little above that i'm like uh 470 right now mm -hmm. but i'm also shooting 74 pounds and i'm shooting a mechanical and i'm shooting you know right at 300 feet per second and the reason i do that uh is because i like using the same pin from zero to 30 Mm -hmm. I'll sight it in at 26 yards and then I'm an inch high at five and I'm half an inch low at 30. And, you know, I, I can, if, you know, deer's going to react and so on and so forth at 30 yards. So I feel like if the deer is inside 30 yards, I put it right there and let it go. And, you know, I don't have to worry about, is he 20? Is he 25? Is he 30, yeah. 18? I can just kill him. Um, just simplifies the math for me. Um, but, but yeah, the Tim knows more about that kind of stuff than, than uh, anything that I could add to that conversation. Yeah. He was blowing my mind, man. And and we'll get off of this in just a second, but I have to tell you this is he so casually said that he has shot animals between a hundred and 130 yards. And if you listen to the episode within 15 minutes, you're going to hear me almost wheezing from laughing so hard. Cause I couldn't believe it. Like, my brain hurt after doing that and the stuff he was saying it, it's just I don't know you know you get guys that are in this for longer than I've been alive I believe what they say you mm -hmm. know what I mean? so um well look talking about hunting let's get into the uh the most interesting I guess thing about your career is you know how to kill big deer <laughs> <laughs> very consistently um, so can you give us a recap of your season from the first buck you killed, which I think was opening day, wasn't it? It was the 18th. Our the season 18th. comes in the 15th. Okay. I, I didn't hunt the first, I guess, two or three days of the season. Um, I hunted the eight, afternoon of the 18th and, um, yeah, so, so that was a South Carolina velvet buck an eight point. Um, and I knew he was in there. He was going from. I mean, then it's, it's a bed to food situation mm -hmm. and I like to do a hang and hunt ambush on that. And I had a lot of cameras out and I knew where he was ending up or his destination food source was up in some crop fields. He was coming out of a swamp bottom kind of up on the hill and I killed him, you know, in between the two on, on an edge where he was getting some green briar and some muscadines. And, you know, I waited until I got two daylight pictures of him coming through there. And then I, I slipped in the third evening and killed him right at dark. Mm. Um, so, so that, that one worked really well right off the gate. And again, you know, that that's going back to what we initially talked about that, you know, the, the funnel situation and how Bobby hunts, he would never in 50 million years do that. He, he doesn't care about shooting one in velvet. He wants some rutted up big neck, um, you know, that that's his thing. Whereas I, yeah. I, I love it. I love our August 15th season and, you know, it's South Carolina. So it's relative. Yes. It's not a 190. It's a 120 inch eight point And I'll it's take good. it all day long here, here at home. It's where I grew up hunting. It's how I grew up hunting. So yeah, that was the, that was the first one. And then next we actually completely shifted gears and we started in late October in Kentucky where Bobby and I actually went in and set up a funnel in March. We had mock scrapes, already had the tree hung, had the cameras out or the stand already hung in the funnel for a North wind. And we were getting a cold front and three days of North. 
And our access, or here's the mistake I made, which which will be interesting. Um, it, it's interesting to me because I've been doing this since I was five and I still screw stuff up. <laughs> we We set everything up. The only thing we had a river below us that was going to be my access mm -hmm. and I didn't walk it out to, there was a road that came through there and the river went under the road and I was going to dip in right there, walk up the river, climb right up the bank into my stand. So that was yeah. my plan. And that's what it looked like on the map. And I was like, yep, good to go. I should have climbed down the bank, walked in the river all the way out to the road and seen what was around there. But I did not do that. I just assumed that was going to be my, my access. So we get there, we go down to the river. It had rained like five inches of rain. And we tried to get down in the river. We tried to get on the edge of the river. And then all of a sudden we're blowing deer out of there. Mm. And I was like, this is awful. So we backed out, went back around, got up to the funnel, and then walked straight across the funnel into the stand. Not ideal, um, but that's what we had to do. There's no way yeah. to get any other, other way. And, I, and my thinking was, this is not, this is going to be, Long range travel. He's going to show up, and you know I'm going to shoot him if he smells where we where we walked across. So, get up, get situated. I've got a cameraman with me, and everybody gets situated. I pull up my phone and start looking at uh, text cam pictures, and sure enough, we had blown that buck out of his bed, or so I thought. Mm. I had a picture of him that ran right through the funnel. And then I had another picture on the end of the farm and it was just his butt running by it. And I was like, well, I have completely screwed all this up. Yeah. Um, and long story short, we're going to hunt it for the next two days till the cold front leaves, get back in there the next morning, get sat down, look as the sun's coming up and there's a giant scrape, mock scrape that he had opened up that night. I didn't get a picture of him because I didn't have a camera right there, but um, I'm like, okay, well then we're, or another buck has opened this up. And lo and behold, 8.30 in the morning, he comes sneaking back through there and I shot him at, mm. at like 20, 20 yards. So it, it it was it was perfect, worked good. It's an 80-acre track in western Kentucky, nothing big, but it is a long-range rut funnel. And as long as I have access to that place, there'll, there will be a possibility pre-rut rut of killing a good deer if there's one in the area because there's literally like seven long range trails that all come together to go around this bluff. That's so that's awesome. a, yeah, it's a good spot. <laughs> um, I missed one. I got invited. Sorry. I'm going to have to back up a little bit. I got invited to a place in Texas in October. Um, it's a, it was a 32,000 acre low fence ranch. And I got invited to come down there and hunt. One of the most crazy managed properties I've ever been on, completely different than anything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you would see 30 bucks in an afternoon. And um, as Where I said, I got a Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope I get, I hope I get the, uh, I hope I get the invite next year too, or right. this, year, I, I really, I, I want to go back. It, it's amazing. Um, and, and they had, you know, they managed the place for, for giant bucks, you know, they yeah. kill, several two hundreds off of it every year. And uh, they had a quote unquote management eight point. that was 162 inches. And so that was the one I was after and, and shot him. I think the second morning I was there just world-class property uh, oh. and, 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 and different, you know, that that's, that's a collection more than really a hunt. Um, yeah. it, it just kind of depends on how you look at it, but you know, that, that's a thing where they've got feeders and, and um, you know, it, it's just a completely different world and different than, than stuff that I normally do. And so that it, it's a fun experience, you know, yeah. getting down to do that. Great people and shot a nice buck and, and those deer are really cool. Um, so that was that was a good one um, from Kentucky. I came home and then on the 7th of November, went out to Kansas and that was where I was going to spend my rut in, in Kansas hunted a property that had a really big deer, but I, it was on a Creek and I couldn't get on both sides of the Creek. And I really needed to be on the North side of the Creek to get on this deer. And I couldn't get over there. So I was getting very sparse pictures throughout the pre rut and rut of this buck all at night. So we kind of aborted that property and went to one I have never been on, but it, it was a, again, kind of a bluff over a river. 
mm-hmm. and kind of a, from a tactic perspective, I went in there and just, th- this is probably the 10th or 11th of November. I just went in there and blew it apart. I, I went in there and walked every inch of it and found another really good pinch point and you could access it off that river. And that river was very low, like ankle deep water. I guess you could call it a creek, but it was probably 20 feet wide. Um, no, not 20, 20 yards wide, it, you know. So it was a, a river that didn't have much water in it. Yeah. So we could access down the river, climb right up the bank into our tree. And there were five trails and a bunch of scrapes that came together right there. Damn. And um, first afternoon, we did a hang and hunt after we had walked it that morning. And I think we saw eight or nine does and went back the next day and it was going to be an all day sit. We had a little bit of rain coming at two o'clock and we saw, I think eight bucks um, before two o'clock. <clears throat> and then it rained, Jeez. rain quit about three. We saw three or four more bucks. And then the big nine point that we were after, he apparently got up and started opening up scrapes and he came right under me and I shot him at four steps and I shot him Ooh. quartering two with a, uh, with a tripan through the junction of the shoulder, the spine into his front side lung and dumped him. He, he, he never even flopped out of there. He was dead when the air hit him. Pretty, pretty cool <laughs> shot. Um, we got all that on video and you, you can hear Lucas. I hope Lucas listens to this, but you can, he's right over my shoulder and, you can hear him hyperventilating. The buck is so <laughs> close. He is he is literally hyperventilating. And I kind of cut my eyes back there at him. I mean, because the deer is so close. And, yeah. I mean, he's <laughs> like, this thing is going to hear you <laughs> at any second. Uh, oh, man. I can see Lucas doing that, too. I'm pictured yes. from behind you just. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was fired up. He, he was fired up. And, you know, he's 20. He's young. And, and so it's really cool to experience stuff like that with him. Yeah. Um, so, so that was good. And, and then really, man, from there, it was down to Mexico for father son trip and shot a couple down there. And, and again, that's kind of like Texas. Not a whole lot to learn there. You, you just getting up a, a, a stand and, and they, you know, they come pouring in. So not yeah. a whole lot there, but but enjoy it because the weather's nice after a long grind and rut um, and having my son with me and the other fathers and sons. You know, it was it's a lot of fun to go down and do that. Man, Joe, you had a great season, dude. <laughs> it was a really good one. Yeah, really it was a good one. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate. I shot four over 160, a 150, and a 120 in South Carolina. So, yeah, it was a good year. That's not, that's not a good year. That's an amazing – four over 160? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was good, man. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it was a good good season. I – um. I, I, yeah, I mean it. It was it was good. I, I uh, obviously put a ton of work in. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, and it doesn't. You know, it obviously doesn't happen like that all the time. You know, it, there'll be years where you you can't buy one. You know, you you can't buy a deer, and and it, so we do we do a bunch of trade shows, and you know, I, I talk to hundreds and hundreds of hunters, and you know, some guys, yeah, I shot two, three great bucks this year, and other guys, man, I had the worst year of my life. And, and that, yeah. it's the, it's a pendulum, right? It's one year's great, one year's not so good, one year's great, one year's not so good, or you have two or three good ones, whatever. You know, I've got several buddies that are big buck killing machines, and, and they didn't kill a deer this year. And a lot of it is they're, they're holding out. You know, when, yeah. you, when you start chasing those mega, mega giants, you know, the 190s, the 200s, you know, you can go three, four seasons without even getting on a deer like you know, finding one of those to hunt. So that's another level. Um, you know, that, that's a whole nother level of, of whitetail hunting and, you know, really going after the top, top tier deer. So, um, yeah, it was a good year, but. I love how humble you are about it. You know, you're not like, you'll tell the story and then you'll just casually say, yeah, I shot four one sixties. A lot of people will be like, yeah, man, I killed this big one and this big one and did this and brag about it. That I respect that a lot. I know a lot of guys that would be doing that, bragging about, you know, thinking they're the baddest hunter in the woods because they oh, killed I know, I know, even I know one. I am, you know, I know that I am not that person. No, I I just love it as much as as everybody else and just work really hard at it. I mean, yeah. I, if if I was going to brag about anything, you know, it, it would be 
the work that I put into it. You know, yeah. I, I work my butt off um, getting access and and putting in the time. You know, when a lot of people are on the weekends this time of year, Netflixing and ball games and doing stuff like that. You know, I'm I'm fixated on you know hanging out with Bobby Worthington. You, you know, <laughs> learning what I can from him, doing stuff with Don Higgins, learning from him. Yeah. And so that that if I had to brag, it would be on the the work ethic and the time that I I put in because I am. I am pretty obsessed about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, Don blows my mind, dude. Like, I'll listen to his podcast, and he's talking about a 170 or 180 he's going to let walk. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, I understand yeah. the wanting 200s thing, but Don, come on, man. It's yeah, great. Five but I bucks, respect it. Five bucks on his farm this year over 170. And he, he, he shot one of them. Yep. I'd give my left pinky toe to be able to find one. Yeah, man. Just one. I mean, the biggest deer I saw. See, this is what all right, so this is what blows my mind. And I think I know what you're going to say to it. And people have heard you know, me talk about this a little bit. But, like, Richard fought. I don't know if you know his, who that is. But he's got 33 Pope and Youngs in the record book. Yep. Super good dude. Unbelievably funny. Um, but one thing that. I guess maybe some of the viewers don't know is that I was texting him uh, end of last season and I sent him a picture of this deer I call tank. And I think I might've sent you a picture of him once or twice. Um, I'm thinking he's like one thirties. He's probably six years old, whatever. And Richard, you know, having killed bucks around, you know, one thirty or higher, most of them being higher. I was like, what do you think? And he, t and it broke my heart, man. He goes, Oh, he's probably one ten. And I'm like, dude, what? Why? Why are you gonna say that? <laughs> like, I'd, he'd still be the biggest deer I've killed, but it's crazy how hard it can be to find these deer. Because I've never seen Tank in daylight except one time, uh, two seasons ago. Never seen him on the hoof, and he's like a ghost. And I only saw my target buck once this year, and you know he. I probably could have taken the shot, but it was a little far. Uh, but other than that, man, like like you were saying, some seasons are great, some seasons aren't. And I've sort of noticed a trend on my hunting where I go one season and I either kill a doe or I don't kill anything. And then the next season I'll get a buck. Yeah. And the next season it's the same and it just sort of flip-flops. Um, so, you know, look, we've almost been at it an hour. Uh, I know that we could be going much longer than this, but there is one thing I wanted to ask you. It's kind of a personal question. Sure. Um, Y'all did a collaboration with Prime. And as you know, Jay Maxwell, he lives 20 minutes from my house. Talk to him all the time. He shoots for Prime. He works with you guys. Um, he was promoting that bow. Yep. Is that something you guys are potentially open to doing with other companies? Like, like I just, I got an obsession, right? And I've been in talks with Dennis. Um, you know, we're going to start promoting their stuff a lot. And you know how they have literally every color under the sun. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if I were to go get a new bow from them and say, hey, you know, I work with Osseo. I'd really like to have their camo on the bow. What is that a possibility or is that? Sure, sure it is. We, we've okay. got a company in Augusta called Specialty Camo, Augusta, Georgia, that has our film and guys can send their bows or guns down there and, and get them dipped. J mm -hmm. Jay got some shotguns dipped in, in yep. Osseo. Um, so, so that's an option and, and yeah, man, we're, we're, um, we, we want to spread the fun around. So if, if there's other bow companies, um, you know, that, that are interested in this, you know, by, by all means, we, we, we would welcome that and, and we're, we're really fair with the licensing agreement and all of that. So yeah, awesome. to, to answer that question. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll reach out to Dennis, you know, sometime next week and just see if he's interested and, in, you know, maybe be able to link you guys up. Um, cause that's something that, you know, right now it's got the, uh, bottomland camo on it yep. and it looks great, but I'm like, man, I'd really like to just be able to look at that bow and see Osseo on there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we go. I it's like so the sound cool, of that. Dude. It's so <laughs> I cool. I like the sound of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it honestly is, you know, you get used to seeing, and, and I've said this to so many people, you get used to seeing the regular camo pattern and they're all great, but y'all stands out. You know what I mean? Like. I was up at uh, Brian Fulcher's place a couple months ago, um, swapping cameras out. And 
you know, he, he had just got some osseo and he pulled it out and I just, I couldn't stop staring at it, dude. I was like, bro, that God, I love that camo pattern. And he, he said the same thing. He's like, this is probably the coolest and you know, best camo pattern that he's ever had. So that's awesome to hear. And y'all, y'all got that magic touch. I'm telling you, it, there's something about it. It just, I, I'm excited to use it this season. Honestly, well, I, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. We're, we're excited me. to have you. Yeah. I see the hat, man. That's good <laughs> stuff. It. We appreciate the heck out of that. And, yeah, and man, of uh, course. appreciate you uh, promoting it and, and very humble to be part of your podcast. And thank you for that. Yeah, of course, dude. I, I always get so excited getting you on, honestly. Um, I guess before we wrap this up, though, I do have one more thing to ask you. I know I've said it. Like yes, three sir. Times. Are you guys going to be at the World Deer Expo? In uh, Georgia. Alabama. Or is that in Alabama? Alabama. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll be there. Okay, good. Well, yep. I will it's come see around you guys. August 18th, I think. 18th, that's, 17th. That's the Buckarama. Okay. Yeah. The World Deer Expo in Birmingham, I think, is like July 20-something. Hang on. I'm, I'm going to look on my calendar. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Is it the is it the nineteenth of July? Yeah, th- yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yes, we'll like be there. Yep, Perfect. we'll be there. All right, yep. cool. I'm uh probably gonna be working the obsession booth, but I'll try to, you know, run off for a few minutes, come see you guys. Um, yeah, we, we, we saw you there last year. We saw yeah. you there last year, and we're we're actually upstairs. Um, we're we're upstairs. We we Rendell found us a rut funnel in, in the in the trade show hall that everybody nice. is forced through. So so yeah, we'll be. <laughs> We'll be upstairs where everybody comes in and comes upstairs. They got to come by the ICO booth. So, yeah, we'll be right there. Awesome. Well, hopefully, you know, the booths are right next to each other because that'd Good be perfect, favorite. man. Yeah, like, they're going to be close. Going to be real close. Yeah, but I plan on being there. Let, let me let me drop an idea. All right. Okay. If this stuff with Dennis works, right, say that he's interested, you're interested, you guys come together. Imagine how cool it would be to have – an Osseo camo obsession bow at the obsession booth. And then you guys being somewhere within eyesight. Yeah. It'd be cool. I mean, very cool. I think, I think that'd be a, I think that's a good idea. That, that might be something I try to try to help them out with and say, Hey, you know, y'all should either be next to each other or across or something. I don't know how the whole thing works. I'm still pretty new yep. to it. Um, but I do pretty much know that we're not going to have the same setup we did last year, uh, you know, with the video podcast and stuff, all of that kind of, Went a certain direction, but um, yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm I'll be down there whether I'm working the obsession booth or just visiting and bothering people like we did last year. Um, but I'm I can't wait to see you guys, honestly. Awesome, man. We're Very looking excited. forward to it. Very much awesome, so. dude. Well, look, good. I appreciate you coming on, Joe. Um, I hate to have to cut it a little short, but dude, it's always fun getting you on. Let's do this again before season and go okay. over some of your preseason stuff that you're doing at the time. Um, yeah, because right now it's kind of, you know, you can go out there and you can scout and shed hunt and all that other stuff, which, you know, both of us have been doing. But um, I feel like right now it's more of just trade show stuff and the tactics that people talk about it. I don't really hear much about, you know, this time of year application with that. You know, it's all spring food plots or shed hunting, really. I feel like a lot of people are looking at turkeys. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not really a turkey hunter, but that's that's what a lot of people are you know, focusing on. So yeah. if you're down, you know, we can pick out another date and uh, get you back on here. Yeah, man, let's do it. I look forward to it. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you.